Okay. Uh, good evening once again for the latest installment of bu uh, Building the Scottish State. And I have the pleasure to welcome uh, fellow SNP members David Henry and Graham Campbell with me this evening to talk about the conference and the result of many of the elections, especially for the National Executive Committee and, uh, and whatever else comes up. So first of all, uh, thank you, David and Graham, for being with us this evening. Pleasure. Good to hear back. <laughs> Just uh, why don't we begin with you, Graham? Just Give us uh, your feel of the conference and what it was like and what the effect of the, you know, the, the elections and decisions, just kind of just a, a general feel for how it transpired. Well, that, that's, that, that would require a, a much longer program than this. But um, let's say that I think that the, the format in itself uh, was always going to be problematic in terms of the lack of the members' ability to properly communicate with each other that, that we did certainly suffer from although the hopping platform is quite good for for some purposes it did stop us from really having a, a motions based conference and, you know it, it, there's some argument about whether we could have had more motions and probably we could have done but the compositing thing was obviously a problematic thing i mean as a trade unionist, I'm quite well used to this. If you've ever been to the SDUC Congress, uh, all of their congresses, even before COVID, were organised in this way. And there was designed, when you have composited motions, which is basically where you cobble together all the motions together uh, about a similar subject, and you, you, you composite them by drafting them all together. Mm. You get a hodgepodge of stuff. You don't get a specific uh, outcome to the way the thing is discussed and that tends to water motions down it tends to it's a tactic that tends to remove radical or you know off center sort of uh, policy ideas uh, and allows basically a, a sort of common denominator mushy kind of resolution to come through now uh, david had the opinion that these weren't constitutional but actually that what they were but they were just wishy-washy and basically restated policy the smp already has so in that respect, the conference arrangements committee that voted on them, normally they what they would do is they would vote for or against or they'd have an internal ballot to decide which uh, conference resolutions would come up to be discussed. Mm -hmm. So we already have a selection process which vets things politically anyway, uh, to some extent gatekeeps uh, what's discussed at the conference. What happened this year was that instead of doing that, they decided just to cobble together these composites. So the, the six themed motions really delivered a lot of Amendments which many people did put, you know, me, me, you know my network put some resolutions uh, to it. Uh, the disabled members group put some important stuff there about the employment of uh, disabled workers and you know, equal rights for them and stuff. So there were some important amendments put into the text, but uh, it was not a satisfactory way of doing business. So just generally speaking, I hope it's the last time we have to do an online conference, but just the format I felt was, okay. was problematic. Time of the results. It's okay, uh, Sorry, no. David. Why, why don't we go to the results after? Go ahead, David. What, just give us your sense of the conference, and then we'll talk about the results. Mm. Well, I think my issue, I and mean, uh, Graham was right. My view of it was it was not constitutional, and I still that's still my view because there was no well, uh, there was ma many things, no matter what the content of um, the six themed motions were, is there was no way of. Uh, uh, having uh, confidence express whether it really supported it or not. It was a for or against. There was no amendment process, no direct negative process. And there's no, I don't see any reason why that couldn't have been allowed. The voting system could e easily allow delegates to go down the normal route. Uh, there was no amendments allowed through from, and I, I, and I actually think we've got to remember whose party it is. It's not uh, any of the committee's party. It's not the hierarchy. It is the membership's, uh, it's the members' party. And I think they felt, like I did, they were being completely excluded from the process. Uh, there was no reason why they couldn't have allowed normal resolutions through. It might have been a bit more prob problematic and taken a bit longer, certainly. But I think, uh, I think many people, uh, I mean, I look at the votes, there was only, I think, 1,400 delegates seemed to ever be involved in any of the voting process out of 2,400. That's a 1,000 delegates didn't bother to get involved in voting for these things. Um, my view was there was, there was uh, in the one that I spoke against on uh, the Sunday, which was the sort of future of 
Scottish independence or whatever it was uh, titled. And it was actually the, the amount of extra flowery words that was added into it, which said nothing at all, delivered absolutely nothing. There was no point having that last paragraph. I mean, I'm all in favour of being other than good public discourse, but to have things like love and understanding, all this, it's just nonsense. Um, and I think whoever did write it and finally agreed the last draft, because um, I know there was a lot of uh, resolutions and a lot of work put in by the branches. I think it was 138 resolutions submitted, which come into just six themes. All the important ones, in my view, were excluded, and that was all the things to do with the running of the party, changing of rules, etc., the issues with the constitution. None of that was allowed. That's all been removed. Um, and uh, I understand there was quite a few important ones that were put forward. Um, you don't really uh, help the party or, or local democracy if you exclude the membership from the processes. And that's exactly what I think happened at the weekend. And I don't see there was any reason for it. Um, the voting, I noticed the chatting, the chat service on the, on the right hand side was not allowed. And I'm pretty certain that was purely just because they didn't want to see what, what the actual delegates had to say. It might be a bit <laughs> embarrassing. So they switched it off. It wasn't available. So it was very controlled. It's not really a conference at all. It's more like just a rally. Um, so I take nothing out of these. So, and this is the issue, uh, Graham. I don't know if you'll agree with me on this, but um, because they were so watered down, they don't actually deliver anything. They're just I, I, I would entirely agree with that, David. But I, I would say that it, there is, you know, if, as I said, if you've been a, a trade union delegate any time in the last 30 years, this is normal practice. And in fact, a week before, I actually attended a very similarly structured conference, which happened only one day with six themed motions, uh, composite in exactly the same sort of way. Uh, there was, though, a massive degree of consent about it. Well, the most important thing the SDC did using that method was in fact that they decided that they will defend democracy and they will campaign for the right of the Scottish people to have a referendum. So they've moved a significant way uh, on, on that um, because there's a, a consensus about it. So nothing wrong with having consensus if there was a broad agreement about something. Um, I think though that there was a sort of yeah, you're quite right that the chat function could have been enabled and I think that should have been done. I also think it you know, but bear in mind, when you say the members, well, actually, the members who were elected by the members decided this. You know, they, they were the ones on the conference arrangements committee who decided this format. They were the ones who put this together. I mean, as I say, I didn't see it until it was published like everybody else. Uh, so, it, it, you know, I'm not satisfied with that way of doing things. I'd much rather have had a motion-based conference, which would be better. Uh, and it's pretty clear that that format was the first time we've tried it. We could have allowed for it. Now we know we can do it. Actually, we could probably do a motion-based conference, but it would, be, as you say, it would have needed us probably another two days to do it online. Well, I mean, uh, it's, it's I, not I, satisfactory I, the way it was, but yeah, yeah. given the limitations, I'm reasonably happy with it. But uh, I suppose in terms of the debates, if you've heard the debates, and there were plenty to speak, you were able to, to do the direct negative. Thing. You're quite right. The, the main problem, I, I've spoken to it myself in one of the resolutions that I would have moved a reference back, a re, oh, sorry, remit back, or uh, an amendment. And I couldn't do that. It didn't give me the facility to do that, even though the technical platform could have done that. And that's something I would strongly argue for. That if we do this again online, that we have the ability to do that. Okay. And, uh, so, what, so, Graham, if you could go on about, a, a little bit about the results. Uh, just uh, Graham has to leave out in about 20 minutes, so I'd like to give him a little bit of a preponderance of the discourse yeah. for the time being. But uh, please tell me about the, uh, the results of the NEC elections. and Because you were, you were or still are on the NEC? I still am. Yeah, I was uh, re-elected uh, as the BAME convener. And one of the problems it sort of shows is that, I don't know if people are fully aware of this, but you know, when people join the party, they tick a box to join the various networks in the party. So you can join the trade union group, and so on. Now, if you're in the trade union group, the trade union group has the database of all those members. So that's how we know that there are, I think it's 12,000 members of, of the trade union group. And they are able to communicate with them. The, the officer who's in charge of the trade union group is able to send them an email. I can't do that with people who've ticked the bank box. Likewise, the people who've done... Uh, disability and the women's officers. So for the last three or four years in the party, we've been trying to get that right to communicate with our supposed membership. Now, 
uh, I, I spent a year in office on the NEC not being able to communicate with the people I was normally meant to represent on, on the committee. Uh, that's a problem. It's only just now been resolved because we were able to have our AGM before the, the, the conference. But for the, that's been a problem of communication. So my, my personal view on this is that the BAME representatives should be elected by the people who've ticked that box to be BAME members. They shouldn't be elected by the whole of conference. Uh, we're affiliates, so therefore, as an affiliate, the affiliate members should vote in the same way that regional NEC members are voted for, only for by conference delegates who come from that region. It should be the same for the BAME network and disability network and for the women members. I, I think it should be the same. So that's the first thing. So I think conference reflected the fact that it was close because there was a a division and um, there's there's a number of things going on i suppose there are those who believe that the party leadership isn't vigorously campaigning for independence enough which i think is ridiculous because you know the SP is for independence that's what it's for um there's those who believe that alex salmon is hard done by uh and that the party apparatus is out to get him there are those who believe that joanne is hard to be uh, done by and, hard, and is out to get him so there are different camps of people who believe those things now, I think they're wrong to believe that, but they believe that, and therefore they're organising around it. Well, there's well, also, well, that, sorry, then well, it's well, also well. importantly to say that the there is a there's been a toxic debate around the GRA, uh, the Gender Recognition Act, which has divided party quite massively, but in which it's impossible to have a an adult open conversation about in, in meetings things or on you know and it's happening toxically online it has been for two years and instead of the party taking a sort of taking it by the reins and saying look let's have debates about this do it in an adult way we've allowed it to fester online in quite negative ways and it's been allowed to target particular individuals on that executive as if they're responsible for all the ills mm -hmm. particularly i'm talking Fiona Roberts and uh, Rhiannon Spear who've been targeted quite nastily in a misogynistic way because i'm partly associated with them i think but in the minds of the people who don't like them uh, there was it was a close result in my case but it, it seems that a coalition of various people have uh, various groups within the party have come together to assault the idea that we should be intersectional and uh, uh, you know in, in our approach to equalities there's also been a, a misconception that equalities people on the executive are somehow responsible for the decisions that the NEC has made that people don't like. Now, in my view, uh, you know, the NEC is only as good as the people who've been elected. And obviously, we've had some different people elected. We still have a, you know, a fairly balanced NEC. I mean, okay, there's some people in there who I don't agree with politically, but I think, you know, if we if we keep ourselves on right, which is we're all there to get independence. And right now, our party is at a very high point of support. Independence is at a high part, you know, process of support. We need to remember that the prize is get a majority in Holyrood in May 2021. Get mm -hmm. our legitimate mandate for a referendum that we've already passed laws to make sure that we can hold without, mm -hmm. with or without Westminster. We've, we've made that preparation so it's possible to do it. So we shouldn't get hung up on date or whether we ask for permission or like that. That's not the point. The point is winning the majority of people round to the idea of independence, which we are doing successfully. We mustn't do anything to mess that up right now. And what is the, yeah, uh, uh, um, and what is, sorry, I forgot what I was gonna ask. Why, why don't you uh, interject, uh, David? <clears throat> well, what do I think? Um, I obviously I, I I created my own campaign. Um, well, like explain I, to, to, explain to the viewers a little bit about <clears throat> what you were running. So I, I put my name forward for national secretary, and I created my own campaign. I didn't have some big idea, uh, and I tried to basically right at the very beginning set my stall out. Uh, one, I don't get involved in these online uh, factions. Uh, I, I don't think I follow hardly anybody that does get involved. And I don't approve of the language. And what I can see is pylons and people uh, basically being quite abusive. Which, if you were to ask me, they shouldn't be allowed to be in the party. Anyone that engages in that, I don't care which side they're on, they should not be allowed to be in the party. A clear breach of our membership rules. They're meant to show respect. They're meant to show good faith towards all members. That seems to have been forgotten by a lot, a, a lot of people. 
and that must stop. It's you're quite right. We're at the, at the peak of popularity. We have the ability to win a majority at the next Scottish Parliament, and we would, if we were to call today, according to the polls, we'd win independence. That is what we should all be focused on. I'm really not interested in any of the minority group and what they're trying to achieve, because you're quite right. Our number one focus should be winning independence and winning a majority. Then after that, that is, the, and I said this during my campaign, the biggest tool in your toolbox going forward politically in Scotland will be an independent Scotland that has full control over all of its finances, its economy. And then we can pass our own laws and we can become a more progressive nation. I mean, one of the things which I've not heard anybody talk about um, in the last year, including via the NEC, why aren't we pushing? We passed it last year at conference to support an increase in the state pension. I believe that's a, a crucial thing and something we should be dis discussing and pushing the fact that an independent Scotland would be increasing the state pension to the European average. The UK has the worst state pension in the Western world, and we should be reminding everybody of that. It's the lowest state pension. Now, the next question then comes, how can you afford it? Well, it's quite easy to demonstrate how you can afford it. So these are the, these are the sort of things I think we should be campaigning on and getting that message out. My, my fear is, I think actually I, I slightly disagree with Graham. I think we should be focusing on a date. My big concern is in everything in life, there's a window of opportunity. Um, I predicted this horrible situation that we're in with Boris as a majority and being dragged out of Brexit. I also predicted that the powers would be stripped from the Scottish Parliament. I said that last December, I raised it just before the election uh, with a, a, one of our government ministers in a branch meeting that I went to. And I said, what's the plan if Boris gets a majority, he uses some form of state of emergency and he strips and he closes down the Scottish Parliament? What are you going to do? And the shocking thing was it had never crossed anybody's mind that any such thing like that could ever happen. That tells me there's not much strategic thinking going on. Because you should always, I think, be ready for the, the unknown. And that's not been happening. And last year, and, and going back to the way the conference was run, I disagree. I think it was completely stage managed. And I think it switches off the membership. And it follows a long uh, path. Last year's uh, Aberdeen conference, I've been at all every conference since I joined the party. Um, and I found it very invigorating. I've learned a hell of a lot. But I've met Graham, I think. A few years ago up in Aberdeen. That's how we know um, yes. uh, Yeah, I remember uh, congratulating on your speech. I thought it was very good. Um, there's some great people in the party. It's a broad church. This is all very, very good and positive. And yet we've allowed the party over the last two years to be hijacked by minority interests who in, on public forums are damaging our, our brand and our image and don't seem to be talking about independence at all. They're talking about all sorts of other things. So I think that's been a, a real mess. Now, I think it's a, basically that because we've been drifting along a bit, we didn't really know what was going to happen with Brexit. I think we should have called independence already. We should have had it now, before the 1st of January. That's my view. And we would have won it. Now we're, we're at the mercy of the UK government. Um, and last year's conference was also extremely stage managed. Um, nothing really significant got, got, got onto the floor. There wasn't really any major things that, I, that got me excited. And I, and I look at what happened back in 2017. I got involved and made one speech, um, which was to help raise the minimum age of recruitment in the armed forces. That was a YSI um, resolution, I believe. It was them that had pushed for it and, and created it. And I did a bit of research and I got annoyed enough to put my name forward because other people were saying they should reject it, etc. And... That was something that was exciting. We were actually create. We actually, and we took a risk. That was a risk. I remember people afterwards. Some people were not happy that I'd helped them win it, um, and told me that we it could damage us politically, and uh, because we'd be seen to be anti armed forces, which of course we're not. Um, that's not what we were saying. But I, I think we need to get back to that sort of thing. I mean, I think we're getting far too timid, um, and. This idea of watering them down and mixing them all together and you end up coming out with something that doesn't really say anything. I really think we need to get back to 
creating real policy. And I would like going forward, and I think this is an opportunity now with this major change in all the different committees. I think it's a, a breath of fresh air uh, for lots of reasons. I think we must start engaging with our membership. The membership is basically effectively cut out of these decisions. Every time we come up with another committee and we've got another, it's another filter. And so less and less of what people at the ground level grassroots actually believe in gets to party politics, become party policy. So I would like to see going forward, and I'll give this to Graham because he's on the NEC, um, to help uh, build a consensus for this. I think uh, going forward, conference committee should produce half, half of the resolutions and the other half should be voted on by the branches and it should be them that make the decision. Instead of it all going through a very select few hands, you could look at it, 100,000 members or whatever it is at the moment, then down to about 25, no, it's about 250, 300 branches, then it's down to so many CAs, then it's down to, you know, the, the NEC's got 42 on it, your conference committee's only six or seven people, I think, it's not very many. This is condensing further and further down. Every time you go down that route, less and less of what people actually want is is being okay. taken up. Well, I, I, need, I need to interrupt you a lot there. Sorry about that. Yeah. But uh, I think we have to just look back a bit. Right? Uh, two years ago, we introduced a new constitution after having had a two-year discussion about it, it to, to talk about the mass influx we'd had into the party post war Right? I only joined the party in 2016, but I've been coming to the conference since 2011. So I've seen the evolution of the party over that time, I've come every year since, you know, first as a guest and then as a delegate. Um, noticing the, the change that's happened, of course, is the biggest change is that most of the activists in the party and grassroots are actually post-2014 members. You know, like myself. Like right? me. We were active. Like me. Uh, yes, so, so, so that's the biggest change. So, so first of all, we're more working class party for a start. I think that's the case because if you look at who's been elected to the leadership bodies since then, it reflects the central belt of the urban areas much more than it used to be. The SAB used to be a very, you know, northeast of Scotland, rural dominated leadership. It's not now. It's a very city based dominant uh, mm -hmm. Uh, structured party. And that's a good thing, in my view, because it represents more of the mass of the people of Scotland, more of the activists who were involved in the Yes movement. But the, the downside of it is that we got so big that we didn't have a structure that could manage uh, and involve those people. So we changed the constitution in, 20, in 2018 to allow for regional conferences and regional committee structures, so the people in their local area, because you know that most people can't make a party conference if it's in Aberdeen, if they live in the Central Belt or in the South, uh, or if they're from Shetland, happen to come to Glasgow. You know, most activists are not going to be able to come to conference, but they might be able to go to a regional conference. And unfortunately, COVID-19, at least last year, has stopped us being able to actually bring these structures into being so that you could go to your regional AGM, discuss policy in more detail with activists that you could see face to face. We've been prevented from bringing you about the new structure that we voted for two years ago. Uh, so that's the first thing. We're lacking that because we've been unable to implement this new structure. It's not that we don't have a structure. We do. We just haven't implemented the change that we've made. So it's put too much pressure on the NEC to, to, to make things happen, which they can't make happen without actual meetings. Uh, we've had national assemblies, and we saw that with the process of the way that the Growth Commission process was handled. We had some actually quite good National Assembly discussions. We only were listened to finally when on the currency question because activists like ourselves put opposition to the currency position and amended it, and the amendment was accepted by the leadership. So it's not true we haven't made policy. We passed the Scottish National Infrastructure Company. That started with a common wheel idea. Members like myself went round to branches to argue that case to branches. Branches supported it, and we won it overwhelmingly. Uh, so it's not true that we haven't passed really important policies that will be existing after. We have done, but we need to do more of it by making the regional structures actually work. It's not the size of the NEC that matters. Frankly, you know, I've been in Zoom meetings with 500 people. You know, you can, it's not a problem of the size. It's a question of whether the decisions that that body has made are communicated properly out to the members. One thing I would agree with everybody who's criticised this is that because we are in a co 
government, you know, basically we, we've got a, essentially a silence vow. We're not allowed to I decide know. what's happened on the NEC. So I can't tell you what the, the yeah, internal yeah, rules are. Rule, 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 so I can't yeah, tell okay. you um, how different people voted on this or that other. I think political minutes of the meeting should be made available to members mm. so that you can politically judge how someone has voted. At the moment, you can't do that because there's no mm -hmm. public way of doing that. So there's certainly an agreement on the NEC that we need to be better at communicating these decisions so that people know why we have done something. A lot of misinformation has gone on, and frankly, it lies have been told about what has gone on on that committee, <laughs> which have misinformed the discussion about what the thing does. Uh, you know, I have to say, my frustration on, as an NEC member has been often our inability to actually do things, you know, based on, you know, you know, there should be a specific date and time that you know the NEC is going to meet, so you can put resolutions to it or, or prepare to lobby it. You know, as a member, you should be able to do that. So that's been a frustration of mine. And so one of the key things that we asked for uh, is to make sure there's a regular date of the meeting so that members know when it meets. And a, a short, pricey minute of the meeting that you know what decisions were made is given to members. That, that should be reported back. So that's the, the, a basic reform which would be good for communication's sake. Uh, I would expect that to happen. Uh, and that has been agreed before for this conference. So that will happen, I'm pretty sure. But in terms of the, the new people who are on it, I have to say that uh, some of the new people on it are, are going to be hard work. Uh, and people have reacted to the... The, the lack of interaction between the, the, the NEC and the membership by not a constructive way. There's some people there who are not going to be conducive to uh, working together, quite frankly, and, uh, and, uh, it's going to be a struggle. And as for what David said about uh, the other issues, and I, I think, I hope I'm not uh, uh, mis misleading, uh, misinterpreting what he said here, but my, my reading of what you're saying is that there are many people in the party who think that equalities issues are somehow marginal or or sidetracking from the question of independence. I don't think so, because the majority of the population come from those marginalized sections of the population. So if we want to win a majority, we have to have something that's for women. We have to have something that relates to black and, disab and disabled and minority groups as well. We have to have a, a prospectus on independence, which is clearly in their interest, because that's the majority of the population. I always say that about working class people. Unless there's a, an, an economic program which relates to working class people's interests, that's clearly right. If I vote for that, I get public mm -hmm. services, I get universal basic income, I work for a society that's going to serve my interests. That's how we get a majority. But it's not either or. We can do both and we have to do both. Yeah. I, 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 um, I was. I was wondering what you thought about what, how we could make these kind of things binding in a sense, because what I, what I fear is uh, like, as the, uh, the United, for example, when the United States was founded, you know, you had the articles of confederation, which kind of, you know, clumped along for a few years. And then you got Alexander Hamilton and a few others together, you know, as delegates to propose amendments to the, the articles of the confederation, they ended up holding the constitutional conference, but it was, but, it, but they designed it to be a very elitist government and it still is. I mean, it's become more democratic over time, you know, with more suffrage, but it's still largely run in the interests of, of, of the corporations as it, as it always has been, you know? And so how do we avoid, how, how do we avoid that in Scotland? How do, I mean, assuming independence is achieved, we don't want, you know, the, the constitution or whatever to be decided by a few oligarchs. We need broad participation. So I was just wondering how, you know, uh, you know what, what types of things we could do to, 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 make, sh to, to make sure that the, what the people vote for in terms of, you know, uh, getting universal basic income, et cetera, is in fact enacted on the other end when it, 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 independence is achieved. Well, I, I suppose um, what we need to... Uh, Sorry, just, just, very, just, just very quickly, Graham, Graham, Graham do you have to go? Well, I, I got, I've decided I'm going to stay on, <laughs> if that's okay. I've, I've annoyed him it's enough. It's too interesting to, to leave. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like I, I, like I, was going to, I was going to come back very briefly to, 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 to Graham's point, but that's not really what, what I was actually aiming at at all. My, my view on, and this is with, this was the clean campaign, and uh, which was aimed at four simple things. And equality is, is central to my belief, absolutely central. And I totally, I didn't sign up to the Women's Pledge, and I didn't sign to the 
the trans rights lobby group either. And I didn't sign either of them for a very simple reason. Uh, one, I don't think you should be beholding to any group, <clears throat> because if you are, or if you have signed up to anything like that, then if you're meant to be impartial uh, and you're meant to make decisions, on, for instance, on complaints, procedures, etc., and you and people perceive you to be uh, linked more to one than the other, then they're never going to believe that you're actually impartial. Uh, but my feeling is uh, setting aside the different uh, the, like groups that are trying to achieve different things. I believe equality for all. You've touched on something which so far hasn't been made party policy. And it struck me that it's quite clear that there are barriers to entry for women and from ethnic minorities and people with disabilities. There clearly is. Um, but there's also barriers to entry um, from people from lower working class, from state education rather than private education. And that's why I come back to, if you look at the higher level that we need to get equality, firmly embedded that this is what we believe in and this is what we're going to do. Now, <clears throat> simple things. Uh, I heard a really good idea from, I think it's the Leith branch in Edinburgh, and they this is before COVID-19. And on I think once a month on a Saturday, they had uh, a women's political cafe morning, which also had a, an ability for them to bring young kids and they were looked after them. Uh, and the women just sat down and talked about what was the important issues of the day. And that is totally different to the way my branch, for instance, uh, meets on a Thursday night at 7.30, usually in a hall. And we, we've had got experience of this. We, where is we your a, branch? Very quickly, where is your branch? Ed, Edinburgh, Sight Hill Stenhouse branch. So okay. um, so we, we had, a, for instance, we had a, a woman a member and she ended up standing for uh, the council elections the last time, but in our neighbouring branch. She always had to make arrangements with her husband, not the what should be happening in the 21st century, but there you go, modern family life, so that she, so he was going to be home to look after the kids so that she could come to our meeting. And one of the things that uh, Graham mentioned earlier, what I see um, going forward, and I hope, I hope HQ is listening, um, let's have the next conference, not only in real life after we've all had our injections and our vaccines, but let's have it online as well. Let's let people sit at home and, and be part of this process rather than you're quite right. And I, I've, I've raised this issue myself because I paid for my own uh, ticket, my own travel, my own accommodation. I never asked the branch for it. But it's exclusionary. As soon as you start doing that, then, I mean, I can I could afford it. So, but there'll be lots of people that can't afford uh, thirty-five yeah, pounds for a ticket, uh, traveling a hotel. I mean, by the time you rounded it up, it's about two hundred pounds uh, for your three days. Uh, the last conference up in Aberdeen, it was a total waste of money and a waste of time. We didn't have a three-day conference, even though it was spread over three days. We had a one-day conference spread over three days. Um, and that's why I don't like what they did this time. I, I, I want the meet. I want people to have uh, the debate. Um, I definitely, uh, uh, so we actually agree on a lot more, I think, than um, I just don't get involved in the different camps. I stay above it all and say, here's the principle. The principle is equality for everybody. And the other thing that I want to reinforce for anyone watching this, uh, you must show respect to each other. It is turning into a bun fight in public, it's going to be very damaging. And this is the sort of thing that the Labour Party's done in the past, you know, and you've got one camp ripping up, and they rip their own party to pieces. We must avoid that. We're, you're right, we've got an opportunity to deliver independence. So let's, if I can say anything, let's focus on that and let, let's get on with it. And what what do you perceive as the major cleavages I, I, uh, with the with the question of Alex Salmond or you know what, you know in, you know a re referendum with or without Section Thirty? What do you see as the main cleavages at this point, that, and how do you think that they could be? Uh, how do you think they could be overcome? Well, clearly, uh, both Alex Salmond and Nicholas Sturgeon are major uh, political forces. Um, I happen to support both of them. <laughs> When I was asked uh, before the court case what my view was on the Alex Salmon situation, I think the charges had been announced or something, and I took a moment before I said anything, um, and I says, well, I believe everyone's innocent or proven guilty, so I'll reserve my judgment till the end of the case. 
And, of course, the newspapers had an absolute field day with it. Massive and massive, I mean, just unbelievably biased coverage. Lots of juicy innuendo and all sorts of things when it was the prosecution. When it came to the defence, there was virtually no coverage at all. Uh, hardly anything was mentioned. Craig Brewery documented this very carefully. Well, I mean, I saw it for myself. At the time, I was running a local pub. I, I, I stopped running it in March this year. Um, and uh, all my, half my local, it's a, I tell you what, it's a great microcosm <laughs> of, of society. Mm-hmm. And they've all, they're all very opinionated. Um, and they would, I mean, we used to have newspapers for people to read and the sun and all that were there. I never read it myself. But um, anyway, they would all, they'd delight in telling me, oh, look at this. Oh, he must be guilty. He must be this. Look all of that. I went, it's a, news, it's a tabloid newspaper. You take it with a pinch of salt. You know, they, lo- they love a good headline. Um, so where do we go from here with the enclaves? I think it's not healthy to go down this route of even talking about it. Let's, it, let's pull together. Remember, we should be respecting each other. Stick to the rules of membership. Um, and let's get back campaigning as one team and delivering what we all know can be delivered. And how do you think that's going to come up? Uh, let me, just very quickly, how do you think that's come about? Because I think I, I know that a, a huge amount of the frustration is not knowing how or when independence will be achieved. And I, and it's very possible. I mean, I, I've been you know thinking about this for a long time. And, you know, right now, as, as a potential no deal Brexit comes into focus, uh, we could see some pretty amazing, you know, incredible things happen in the next few weeks. You know, I don't know what you know, arrangements maybe Nicholas Sturgeon has talked to, to, to Michel Barnier about, but, you know, who, who knows? I mean, the Europe, the Europe, have to, they, they have to deal with Northern Ireland, they have to deal with, you know, and Scotland has, you know, more than clearly expressed its desire to stay within the EU, and the EU doesn't want to kick anybody out. How do, how do you, I mean, so my reading of this, maybe in, I'm wondering what will be in the manifesto for the, for the election in May, and whether well, that's too many questions in the world go. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Let, let, let's break that down a bit first. Sure, sure. Sorry. The, 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 I suppose the, the key thing about, for the party in terms of the strategy for independence, right, we have already set the precedent of having uh, had a, a recognised referendum. The reason for that was not because we needed to be recognised by bloody Westminster. It's actually to be recognised internationally by the European nations especially. We need to have a referendum that's legally solid in order to be recognised by them. Now, prior to Brexit happening, that was a more difficult question, but now with Brexit happening, uh, it European nations are much more likely to support our vote, regardless of how it happens, actually, I, I actually think. But the, the key point about the, the timing is that we would have had it, I believe, this autumn, had we not had COVID, because that was clearly, from my understanding of the, the strategy, was the clear intent that we would have it this autumn. Uh, um, and indeed, the, the expression that Ian Blackford himself said, which was slightly back, backed off from, but he felt that it should be in autumn 2021. Now, I think it should be in autumn 2021. After we have a mandate for it, we should just hold it in autumn 2021 because that's my preferred timing. But I wouldn't, I'm not copper fastened to that timing. Timing to me is less important than will it be recognised by our European partners? Because that's the key point question. It's, it's the people who get caught up on whether we should have a majority vote in the Hollywood to do it, UDI. It's actually not how we declare it it's who it's recognized by that matters uh, and that's the point what's the their yardstick for recognizing our vote now our european partners have a, a directly vested interest they now don't have to give a damn what britain thinks before they did now sure they don't have it. <laughs> should they've had it up to here yes you? now they don't have to so they have every reason to recognize our vote however we do it as long as it's legal by our processes which is why it's so important that we passed all this legislation this year to make it possible for us to control the referendum that's, that if that's not preparing to do this i don't know what is so the people who are impatient well, look what we're actually trying to do we're actually making it possible for us to have a legally authentic referendum whether it's recognized by Westminster or not ideally I prefer it to be recognised by Westminster for this reason only. If we saw as in Catalonia, where no voters just didn't turn out to vote, right? We need one where no voters will turn up to vote and recognise the legitimacy of the vote. If we just have yes voters turning up, even if we have a majority of the electorate voting in it, if no voters don't vote, that will invalidate our vote 
in the eyes of many of, of our potential friends and partners who might recognize it otherwise. I think if we get a recognized vote that no voters will participate in, then there will be no dispute about the result. And that's what I want. I want, if it's possible to have a legal vote, which is no, not disputable, I prefer that. We're pursuing a strategy, that's plan A. Now, plan B, everybody, I can understand why what people want plan B, but in a way, we don't need to tell our enemies what our, our strategy is <laughs> too overtly. That's, that's just my thing. I, I think um, the next election could be used uh, as a plebiscite, and I've heard people say this. Yes. If there's a clear majority for the SMP and maybe the Greens and any other party for that matter, that in their manifesto, their key thing is to deliver independence and that they get the clear majority of the vote, then the people have decided. And actually having a referendum is really just uh, to confirm what's already been decided. So I think there's a lot of people that seem to hold that view, and it does seem to be um, quite widely supported. So perhaps that's what we should be fighting on and pushing our party to put into the manifesto, which is if you vote SMP uh, in May 2021, you have voted for independence. And if we get, I don't know, uh, 60% of the vote, because we're in the polls, not far from that at the moment, 58% I saw, um, then we we voted for independence. I, I, I attended uh, an Irish um, uh, uh, politician's talk a couple of weeks ago. It was very interesting. Um, my MP, Joanna Cherry, was speaking on it, which is how I found out about it. And, and two things came out of that. One was Spain isn't interested uh, anymore uh, and isn't apparently going to put up, it hasn't got any uh, things against Scotland being in the EU because, of course, and the EU itself owes the UK absolutely no allegiance because the UK is no longer a member state of the EU. We have actually elect, we're currently in this transition period, which ends in a few weeks. And uh, I think there's huge support. And, and this chap was saying that the Irish government will be the one of the first nations, European nations, to sponsor Scotland's application in the EU. Um, things have changed. Brexit has changed, I think, everything. It certainly changed everything from my point of view. I must thank David Cameron for um, being such an incompetent uh, prime minister and making such unbelievable risks and taking risks. Because um, even in England, if you were to run the same poll again uh, for on Brexit, you'd now find it's remain. Uh, people now see it. It was a folly. Uh, it was a very close run thing anyway. Um, and you can't really have a United Kingdom, which had four nations in that vote, because it's not the British people. It was four nations as the United Kingdom that's a member of the European Union, not Britain. Britain isn't a member. <laughs> it's the United Kingdom that's a member. And uh, two members of the United Kingdom voted to remain in the EU. Two voted to leave. Well, the logical answer to that is you let the two that wanted to leave to leave, and the other two stay as member states of the EU. And we could have taken over the UK's membership and just had it ad adapted. Um, why didn't we go down that route? Successor state, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. successor state. So I don't think it's going to be a, a, an issue for Scotland to join the EU at all. I think that will be quite a simple process. Um, when it comes to recognition, I would ask people to go back and remember that in 1959, the UK state, British state, was campaigning in Malta, telling the Maltese that they couldn't possibly survive on their own. They wouldn't. They were going to starve because they'd only have 25% of their food. They couldn't defend themselves. What currency were they going to use? It all starts to sound very familiar. <laughs> <That's> familiar <man. laughs> and in 1965, the tiny little country of Malta voted for independence and left the UK, and which are now a member of the EU. So, there, and then, so if a country the size of what is it, the Isle of Wight, uh, can become an independent country and thrive in the EU, then I think you'll find a country like Scotland, which has slightly more population than Ireland, has its own oil, gas, and renewable energies, produces enough food to feed itself, and exports more than it imports. I'm pretty certain we can be a very successful member of the EU. I'm looking forward to the ferries going from Versailles to Holland multiple times a day. 
That was in the resolution, David. <laughs> oh, well, I missed that one. <laughs> it was one of the key points they spoke about. So, so actually, it was, there was one useful bit of policy that you agree with. <laughs> well, I, I didn't say I dis disagreed with him. I got a talk. I, I got asked to speak again, as a speaker again. Obviously, I thought. I know what you mean, though. Yeah, yeah. I, you, they thought there should have been a possibility to amend things. And well, that's all I would have. I would have proposed an amendment and to make it an absolute date and an absolute commitment, etc. And that's what I would have been proposing. So I, I don't have an issue with that. Funny enough, I've been banging on about the the ferry link because I've done a lot of travel. I used to be, live in London, and I've done a lot of travel from Dover to Cali, and I've done the Geneva Motor Show for about eight or nine years in a row. So I can give you a little insight of what Brexit Britain is going to be like starting in a couple of weeks' time. Um, I took a whole van of stuff for the Geneva Motor Show, a giant, the biggest van you can get. Uh, I had to have a customs agent in Dover. I had to pay them fees. I had to fill out all these forms and have all these codes for every damn product that was on the van, including the sheets of pieces of wood that I was taking to help build the stand. Well, this all had to be listed. You have to come up with a code of what type of material that you're taking. Uh, that's fine. So you, you get all that, and then you have to go through HM uh, Customs, and you have to wait to be called in. So this takes hours, hours of time wasted. Then when you do that, you've gone through all that, then you get your sheet that's been stamped you can now go into the dover port now you can get onto the next ferry to get across the channel then when you're in france that's all fine uh you get up to geneva then you've got another border oh god the other border where if you don't have your paperwork uh, and you can get there at the wrong time they close at lunchtime for two hours um they're shut on a sunday and they're only open half a day on a saturday and if you get there at the wrong time and you've not got the right paperwork, you'll be stuck at the border for two days and you have to have an agent as well. And this will cost you hundreds of pounds uh, for your agent to fill out pieces of paper. And this is what Britain has voted for. This is what Brexit means. And when I came back, this is last year, um, it, I had to wait half a day because the agent was waiting on the, the, their, their customs people, pay the hundreds of uh, euros in fees. So I could leave the country and finally start driving back through France to get back to Dover. Then it's go through the same process again. Uh, so <clears throat> Brexit will be a disaster. Brexit is a, a massive step backwards. Scotland can do so much better. We must have our own trade routes. We must. And people talk about war, about what about a hard border? So isn't that what Britain voted for? Put up borders between us and the EU. I think I don't see a problem having a border with England at all. Uh, there's The one thing I liked about driving across Europe is the borders are invisible in most of the countries. Yeah. And I've done it before. I've driven um, from London to Dover and Dover to Calais and Calais through to, that usually was Dunkirk. So a bit of France, then Belgium, then a little bit of Holland and then Germany and then all the way back again, all in one day just to get a contract signed in case the courier lost it. So it was, it was very important. Um, so I did it all in one day. And I, I remember coming back thinking, I've just whizzed through four countries, backwards and forwards in one day, and then I'm back in England. And guess where the border was that I had to go to customs? It was in England. They wanted to, they wanted to check what, where had I been, what had I been doing? And I said, what, what's in the folder? And I went, well, it's a contract. They wanted to see the contract. Went, You're not really allowed to do this. You know that, don't you? Uh, <laughs> but anyway, there you go. That's what it was. Oh, right. Um, and, and I had a tiny little car on hire, the smallest car you can get, a Citroen C1 thing. And yeah. they said, have you got any hidden passengers? Which I couldn't stop laughing. I went, well, if you can find somewhere to hide someone in this tiny little car, go ahead. Have a look. You can all of them and put them in the gas. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, unless you can, unless they're holding underneath the car. There's, there's not a boot. There's nothing. It was just ridiculous. Anyway, I've diverged a little, but Brexit Britain, I must thank Boris, I must thank Nigel Farage for their narrow-mindedness, because yes. Scotland Scotland <clears throat> has voted against what they've done. We don't have to put up with it, and we're leaving, and yes. we're rejoining the, the world. And I tell you what, that's the other thing I think that's changed massively. Um, we've now got rid of Trump. My God, thank God. It, <laughs> however. 70 million people voted for him. And there's a warning. And I'll tell you what, it brings me back to my little campaign. Respect, uh, equality for all. It's extremely important that the tone of debate in public 
is set from the people at the top. And so we might have disagreements in certain things, and, and that, that certainly does happen. I don't have the same priorities as some other people. However, if we if we stick to being respectful, um, I think we're all we all benefit from it. I would agree with that, David. But I have to say that uh, some of the people who have been campaigning for, against various people, including against me, have not been respectful, and in fact have utterly distorted uh, the the debate that that should be happening. Now, I'm afraid that that's an example of this, as in this chat just here. I mean, somebody's quite rightly commended you for talking about pensions. Uh, mm. But of course, pensions were a key ingredient of the campaign in December 2019. Indeed, Anne, who got elected here in Glasgow mm. North East, has been leading on this very subject mm. and led it in that election. So it's not true that the party put it in the back earlier, in my view. We actually had it out front as a major issue in the election campaign, no, which I, was I, successful I, in winning a lot of support from the older generation. But it has to be said that when you say things like, you put this on, you're putting pensions on the back burner in favor of minority groups. Well, sorry, pensioners include women, black people, and minority ethnic people, and even some trans people. They, they you know, Pensioners are not a monocultural group. Pensioners are a broad group. And we should just understand that equality just seems to be a thread that runs through all policy, which will you know, if, if we do something right by pensioners, if we do something right by women, we're actually helping other communities as well while we're doing that. It's not an either or. These, it's inclusive of these things. And we I, stop I, seeing I, it as a I, divisive I, agenda. It's a connected, intersected agenda. I think my take, my take on that, Graham, though, I've seen, I've seen the note, um, and uh, I don't take it quite so negatively. I think uh, I voted for that resolution, by the way, you know, the, the increasing the pensions. And I put in a speech card for it, um, but I didn't get picked because, and I'd researched, how can we, because it's all very well coming up with, uh, and, and I see this in the Labour Party, they come up with some great ideas sometimes, and they've never actually priced it and costed how they're going to afford it. So the, the, it's, so I had, I'd done a bit of research. What would we do? What would we be saving once we're independent? So I worked it out very quickly. Uh, we wouldn't be spending £3.5 billion pounds a year on uh, defence spending, of which only one billion is spent in the in Scotland, so two and a half billion is spent actually elsewhere in the UK. So that would be one saving. We wouldn't be spending and contributing to things like HS2, which they claim is going to benefit Scotland, which it clearly isn't. It stopped at Birmingham. And I don't see how getting to Birmingham 20 minutes quicker actually is much of a benefit, to be perfectly honest. Um, and uh, so we wouldn't be spending on that. Uh, cross rail across London, uh, apparently is a national infrastructure that benefits people in Scotland. It certainly does not. Um, so I think all those things we wouldn't be spending on. And I worked it out that it was about nine billion a year. And then I worked out how much uh, the, the raised the uh, pension on pensioners in Scotland up to about the two, 250, 300 pounds a week, which is about the average across the EU. And it turned out you could afford it from those savings. Oh, and the other thing we wouldn't be paying, we wouldn't be paying three billion a year uh, in debt interest on the UK's debt mountain, which continues to grow to tr two plus trillion pounds. But what was important, I never got the chance to say that, is so we passed that resolution, which I fully supported, but nobody got up on the stage to put that, those arguments forward. How can you afford it? Because that's obviously what your opposition is going to come and attack you on. Uh, how are you going to be able to afford it? You've already got a deficit, etc. We don't have a deficit. Jer's figures are an estimate. Yes, <laughs> they're not. Jer's are a lie. Yeah, basically, well, they're, they're, they're an estimate. They're not. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go down and use that word. Well, they were deliberately. Um, they're an estimate deliberately designed to mislead because, of course, they don't take into account all the assets and the economic base of the country in the plus column there's, against there's, the there's taxation a, and liability. There, there's a, a very useful. Uh, there used to be a very useful amount of data released by HMRC, and it would do go through the quarters. So there was a quarterly import-export, um, basically GDP. But import-export uh, data was produced every quarter, and it was detailed for the whole of the UK and the different regions, etc. And Scotland, every single time, exports more than the import. And I'm, uh, I can read a set of accounts. I'm not an accountant. But if somebody's selling more than they're buying, then they're, they're making a surplus. <laughs> they're making a profit. Scotland makes a profit. This explains why they don't want us to leave. Yes. 
We are the third richest region of the UK after London and the South East. Of course, they don't want us to go. Yeah. But let's, let's, so I don't take uh, that on board saying it's that negative about that. I, I, that's, that was the point I wanted to make. Uh, we're not pushing that great pension thing. I think that should be part, I think it should be our next for the campaign, certainly for the yes campaign. It should be a major part of the campaign. And in an independent Scotland, the Scottish state pension is going to be in line with the EU average. It will go up from £168 a week to approximately £300. It can be afforded for by, we won't be paying for this, 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 and this. Here's the numbers. Really simple message. Anyone can understand that. I, I, I take what, what the person was saying there, that we're not pushing it. Yes, we've passed it. Yes, it's policy. But we're not selling it to anybody. Well, I, I, I'm certainly sure that it will be a major element because obviously last time we lost the referendum because a significant majority mm -hmm. of pensioner age people did not vote for us. Uh, but this time, I think that that is shifting, partly because this last year they spent a lot more time with the younger generations in their family. Uh, and I think as well, they've seen the negative results of the last five years since we didn't vote yes. So, you know, they can now see that the economically insecure route is to stay in the UK, because that's a surefire way of staying in pension of poverty. So, uh, you know, I think we, we can win a majority of pensioners this time. I mean, I that's think one of the messages we, we're going to need to use to, to bring them. I think there's one other thing, um, one other thing that, that's changed is uh, in 2014, uh, approximately a quarter of a million European citizens uh, that live in Scotland, that's their home, you know, they, um, they voted no. The majority of them voted no because the, the threat to them was, well, if you vote yes, you're leaving the EU because the UK is the member of the EU. It's completely now the other way around. And those quarter of a million will now be voting yes because we're going to rejoin the EU. Um, so I think there's two bits. That not only that, that the age, the age demographic has changed. There's been new waves of new people joined in the last six years who have now got voting age. They weren't able to vote before. Uh, it's sad to say that uh, and COVID-19 certainly highlighted this as well is that uh, far too many of our older generation have passed away. I had, I had a member uh, of my branch die um, just over a month ago, which I found out, um, which is a great pity because he was, he was a lovely man and used to come and do polling duty and that. And I found by accident. Uh, so it felt like a member of the family had passed away, you know. Um, so I sent my regards. In fact, our whole branch sent our uh, condolences, etc., and that's happened. I'm afraid too many times. I know, I know, of, uh, uh, at least one or two others as well. So, just demographic age uh, shifts. I think the other thing, and this is uh, Graham as well, and she'll probably agree with me on this. Uh, we've identified a major uh, thing going forward for the party is we've got to get our post people on postal vote because in Edinburgh, we are quite this part part of Edinburgh, a large part of it, it's quite a conservative area. The Conservatives have, I think it was 37% on postal vote. We've got 24%. If the weather's bad on the 5th of May, our vote doesn't turn out because it's raining, uh, whereas theirs does because it's been posted. We must get our postal vote average up uh, because it will it will help us win, win seats. I have to say that, sorry, Mark, um, to, want to come and ask a question? Just a, yeah, I mean, what scope is there for having, for example, electronic voting or uh, you know blockchain voting within you know for, for the Holyrood ones? I don't know if it's something that could happen. Zero, <laughs> zero. Uh, we'll be voting by post or in person. Um, uh, obviously, if COVID restrictions. If we have another outbreak, then it's possible that it will be all. Uh, posted. And so David's quite right. We're going to also have to probably have a massive campaign uh, to to register people to vote. Because yeah. the other thing as well is that the, I know Edinburgh well enough to know that actually the, the areas like yours where there's be part of the constituency where the turnout is ridiculously low, but the support yeah. for the SOP who turn out uh, makes it easy we win the vote, but it's yeah. too many, many people are not registered to vote. So we're going to have to mass register people to vote in the first place. And that's particularly true of BAME communities because many people from EU or from 
in Africa or Asia don't know that they can vote in the yep. Hollywood election. Uh, so many of them are not registered for that reason. So we need to go on a mass registration drive to bring those people, particularly in SMP supporting areas, working class people who've been disenfranchised. We, like we did in the referendum, we brought many people to voting uh, because of that. So we need to do that again, majorly. Okay. I totally agree. In, in the European election, which I'm organiser for the constituency, so it was the first election that I had to basically <laughs> deliver myself or, or help arrange um, because I, uh, I, that was the first time of being an organiser to help deliver it. And we had identified during the council elections that there was a lot of Polish community in places like Wester Hills, etc. And we found out that either they were totally disengaged, so they didn't even know there was an election coming, <laughs> Um, or they weren't registered at all, and they didn't know that they actually had a vote. So in the EU election, I brought up at a meeting and uh, brought the three branches together, and we had representatives from all the branches. And I said, you know, we should we should uh, concentrate and try to get the Polish community uh, uh, to make sure that they're going to vote in this EU election. After all, they're EU citizens, and that's when I discovered that, of course, the UK government meant they had to sign another declaration. So there was another form that they had to have signed. Otherwise, they weren't going to get the vote. And it wasn't available online, and they didn't make it easy to find. So I actually got uh, one from uh, the Electoral Commission's office in Edinburgh, and we went to the printers, and we got hundreds of them printed. And when we stuck them all in envelopes, along with our material and our letter, into European supermarkets in our area, and they put them on their shelves, along with our posters, uh, telling them to help us keep Scotland in Europe, in Polish. Uh, and I went back after the thing, and they were all gone. All the forms have been taken. We know it worked, uh, that people signed them. People, some people even signed up to, to vote. They hadn't registered to vote. So I totally agree. We need to do it again. Uh, and we need to go around these areas and get, get our people switched on. But then they're only going to vote if there's something for them to vote for. Absolutely. We did the same in Glasgow Northeast, by the way, with uh, the Chinese community and with uh, the Nigerian and the African, you know, West African communities here. Uh, we, we targeted them specifically. And what the response we got back from the Chinese community was we were the first part yep. to actually approach them in their language and actually ask their opinion about something. It went like wildfire, registering the form to register mm -hmm. votes uh, on the phone. People send it through their mobile phones. You know, people from China send it to their relatives, who then send it to their relatives here in Glasgow. It it was really well supported. We, I know we got a sizable chunk of votes from the Chinese community simply because we asked and because we cared about what they thought. You know, you know, yeah. That, yeah. Well, so we will pick up votes if we if we do it right. I see uh, someone's asking a couple of questions about the EU. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah. I uh, my my view on this is quite simple. Uh, I never thought being a member of the EU is a bad thing. In fact, I, drew, I raised with somebody EU Directive 2003 stroke 88, I think it is, otherwise known as the Working uh, working directive. Time Directive. Yes. So everybody goes on about, oh, it's it's great for big business and it's about, you know, well, it is. It is. Uh, it does have many advantages for big businesses, you know, single market, uh, moving tariffs, moving trade barriers etc. Um, so yes, it does. However, it also uh, has huge benefits for consumers uh, when it came to air travel with much cheaper uh, uh, roaming costs on mobile phones. I mean, you know, the only, the only country that was uh, uh, campaigning against the EU ending the roaming costs? Oh yes, the United Kingdom, the same country that also argued against the working time directive, the United Kingdom. We, we never seem to want the social benefits <laughs> to our consumers. Um, and that was because I believe Vodafone is one of the main contributors to the Conservative Party, and they were, they were campaigning not to bring this in because it's very profitable to charge people a thousand pounds for some data when you go across Europe and you forgot to switch off your mobile data button. Um, so I just wish people would understand that. And the difference with it, the guys, the person who's asked, um, on whether it should be uh, EFTA or the EU. Well, EFTA members still have to pay large sums of money to be a member of this single market. They still have to take nearly all the rules, so but they have no say in the rules. So why would you pay, still carry on paying 
into what is effectively EU, but not have any say in it. Um, so I don't, I don't, I, I think we should be in the EU. I think we should put a positive case forward, and we should campaign on it. And if people vote for it, then the people have had a, uh, an input. I think I, 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 I I'm really. Totally surprised that I agree a lot more with you than I thought I was going to. <laughs> Actually, uh, I would agree with the case you made earlier for us taking up successor uh, state status as the member of, of the EU, because uh, we already are in regulatory alignment. We already have access to the market today. We won't have after 1st of January. But, you know, we, we are, to all intents and purposes, the British member states, and we should effectively take their seat. That would be the cleanest way of doing this. I would like to see the government apply for uh, collective uh, citizen rights, because obviously this is a question of the, the, the European Court of Human Rights that usually deals with individual rights. I'm, I'm told by various lawyers on both sides of this argument that no, you can't have collective rights as a nation to your treaty rights under the EU, uh, you know, Amsterdam Treaty. I think maybe it should be tested in the courts. I, I would like to see our government go to the European Court to test whether the Scottish people have treaty rights, having voted to remain in the European Union. I'd like to see that tested. But in terms of the EFTA thing, if we are outside when we are independent, when we have voted for independence, or we're in a transition period away from the UK, uh, and we have the right to join EFTA, I would do it as a holding position. But I would also have a referendum to rejoin the EU if, if it proves that we can't just seamlessly rejoin. Uh, I do think we should ask the people. Uh, you know, that, that's I, 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 I have a suggestion, which is why don't we just join the EU and then in five or ten years' time uh, we do a Nigel Farage and <laughs> we then give the people the opportunity to um, vote us back out again. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> All right. Well, I'd like to I'd like to wrap this up. So I just would w want each of you to just say something that you'd like to say. You know, I mean, just give a, a give, give an opportunity to you well, know, kind of your conclusion from the conference. How do you see everything going forward? Are you more optimistic than pessimistic than you than you have been before? How do you, how do you see things? I think the conference. I think the conference itself is a waste of time. But I think the exercise, and I think, it, I think it's been very positive. I know that people, some people might disagree, but um, I think it's been a very positive thing to see so many members get actively involved, take an interest for a start in the, the, me the mechanisms of the party, like the NEC, et cetera, and the office bearers and the different committees. So um, I'm very optimistic that uh, we're now in a better position than we were before, because I did feel that the NEC was malfunctioning before. Um, and I totally I agree with one thing that Graham said. And my resolution, which I put forward for transparency, specifically detailed adding in 2.11 into the standing orders for the NEC. And 2.11 was going to give the National Secretary the authority to share the minutes, uh, agendas, etc., with branch secretaries. And the reason I wanted to limit it that way is purely because of the concern that if we had radical elements inside our membership who want to damage our party and leak stuff because uh, i don't see how you can control uh the, the 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 documents if you don't have physical control over them so from that point of view um i think it's a very positive position we're in i just would like to say my my last thing i would like to say is i'd like all members to respect each other and tone down the rhetoric and start to work together and that goes to all the different sides so i think that's i think we're in a better position I, I hope that what david says transpires because uh, we are in a very good position as a party we we must not mess it up now uh, but the truth is that we do have some very divergent opinions now we did have before i mean obviously i was on the nec and I, i'm a revolutionary socialist so you, you know, can't get more divergent than that uh, but there, but there's pretty clearly uh, some people who've joined the debate within the party in a way that's not exactly constructive. Uh, I don't, as you say, you didn't sign up to the Women's Pledge. I didn't either. Uh, but I am a signed up supporter of the other side to that because I, I just think the equality thing is just, it's a no-brainer for me as an equalities activist. Uh, you know, you, no one can be free until everyone is free. And I think there's been such appalling rhetoric by some of the people who are now on that committee. Now, I hope I could work with them in some way. I, I really hope so. Um, and I hope that we are able to come to a view that we keep our eyes on the prize, which is, you know, 
that we wanted. Mm-hmm. Because we have to win this election and then we have to get that referendum. So if people keep their eye on that and you know, try and ignore the offstage noises about this person's hard done by that person hard done by that. By the way, when I stood uh, as a candidate for Edinburgh Western, I was asked specifically, what, you know, we were all asked quick fire questions uh, by, by members from the branch uh, about what we thought about certain things. One of them was, do we think Alex Sandman should be a member? And I said, yes, because I think he should be. But uh, that doesn't mean I think he should be returning to the leadership of the party. It doesn't mean I think that uh, his, the, the brilliant leadership that Nicola's given should be undermined. I don't think it means that she should be attacked in the way that she has been, uh, uh, you know, in, the, in, the, in an appalling way by some people online. Now, obviously not all of those are members, but there's a sort of caucus of people that are, are, are putting up this message that somehow our leader is not in favour of independence, which is ridiculous. You know, this, this needs to kind of stop. Now, if there are people on that committee that have that narrative view behind them, they're going to be hard to work with. I hope they don't. Uh, but I, I look forward to a time when we can concentrate on the task we have ahead of us, which is we must win this election. We must consolidate our majority for independence by winning more people to it. And we cannot appear as a divided party. If we do that, we will mess it up. Uh, there's no doubt that divided parties do not win elections, or at least divided parties could not won't win them as convincingly as they otherwise would do. Um, we need to get away from the concentration of the individuals, concentrate on the basic thing that we stand for, which is to get out of Westminster. What we're doing is a profoundly radical thing, by the way. That's why it's dangerous. And I don't doubt that uh, there are people and elements in there who are designed, whose intention is to mess the party up. I, I don't doubt that. There are some people in, in the party now who because the party is a legitimate threat now to the British establishment. We are, after all, for the breakup of the United Kingdom imperialist power. You can't get more democratic and radical than that. That's a revolutionary thing to do. It will change international uh, relations forever. It means the United States will not have its junior partners in wars in the Middle East anymore. It, it's going to change things radically. Of course, there are forces to trying to stop that. And the way to stop that is to mess up the internal politics of the SNP. So let's right. be careful about what we say, who we say it to, but also be clear that when we disagree, we're going to do it not disagreeably. So we agree on one, on one core thing, which is we should be respecting each other and engaged in respectful debate. And, let, and I agree, let's stay focused on delivering the goal. That's what's most important. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that that's what's... What, what's going to happen. On that note of unity, I will uh, leave you gentlemen. Thank you so much. And I hope that uh, I hope that I, I, I agree with your optimistic vision. And I hope that it is uh, well founded going into the next months. Uh, just one quick thing. Uh, d- d- uh, Graham, do you have any input on uh, the, the the manifesto? Do you? Uh, uh, are you able to contribute some way to the to the to the way the, to the way the manifesto is written is written for the SNP? Um, I have no idea, to be honest. Um, I, I assume that the Policy Development Committee will have something to say about this, because otherwise, what would they be for? Um, um, I would assume that the NEC will see some kind of draft, uh, but to be honest, I don't know. Uh, there isn't really a, a prescribed, written-down procedure for this. I would assume, though, that the National Assemblies that we have coming, which partly will talk about the, you know, the, the strategy in January, but clearly uh, there will be a National Assembly or a Spring Conference of some kind, which will put down a, a, a something like a manifesto. I would hope that members get to see that and that as many members, whether they're on the NEC or policy committee, get to see it and get an input on it because I think it's important. Well, that, that'll, that'll be very important to, to see, to gauge to what degree the, the, the grassroots of the party is able to have input on the, on the manifesto itself. So, okay. All right. So on, again, on that note, I shall leave you both and uh, thank you so much for, for, uh, for, uh, for being with us and uh, we'll have you back soon. Thank you. Good luck, Nice to hear about your music. (laughs) (laughs) Never miss a live stream. The What's On Guide to live stream events and shows now has its own website 
You can find the guide at whatsonguide.scot, independencelive.net or on multiple Facebook pages. Do you create your own live stream events and shows? Get them registered on the guide. See whatsonguide.scot for full details. This is a new voice for a new Scotland. We know you're busy people, so most of our shows are also on demand on our Scottish Independence podcast channel, available wherever you get your podcasts. You'll see what a great variety of shows we have. There's something for everyone. Our newest on-demand platform is Indie Live Radio's YouTube channel. We have set up playlists for our most popular shows and current topics, currency, disc parties. New content is added almost daily, so subscribe and you won't miss anything. Join us. Thanks for listening. Independence Live. That's where you'll find the footage. It's not acceptable to say we just keep on trying and we have another mandate and we can have another mandate and we keep on trying. You've got to make a political judgment that it's not going to work and say, well, in that case, we have either got to admit that we're not going to go for independence. And this is where I think the government has not been honest with people. That is, I'm not saying it will happen. I'm just saying that it is at least a possibility. If we hone in totally on Section 30, we could not get a referendum at all um, under Section 30. And therefore, that to me means that you've got to find another way. But I don't think anybody who has gone over to yes now is really for moving because I think they can see clear as day what things look like. And I always felt that during the independence referendum that it would take a no vote in order for a lot of Scots to realise the consequences of voting no. They would have to see what happens when they vote no in order to realise what a mistake it was. And to me, that's the clear blue water between staying in the UK and going for independence. It's clear, regardless of what Boris Johnson said the other day, that they will want to go back to business as usual, where the ultra-rich are the ones who gain from everything. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be part of that. We want the chance to actually build a fairer country. 
It's the Brexit stuff for me, the nepotism stuff for me, breaking international law stuff for me, the ERG hijacking UK democracy stuff for me, education is a luxury stuff for me, £9,000 tuition a year stuff for me, it's the NHS on the table for a US trade deal stuff for me, demonising the working classes stuff for me, refusing starving children free school meals stuff for me, it's Boris calling Muslim women letterboxes stuff for me, his picking any comments stuff for me, his bum boys comments stuff for me, his Scotland as a verminous race comments stuff for me, the UK internal market bill ripping up the devolution settlement stuff for me, devolved legislators being ignored during Brexit stuff for me, a lack of UK leadership during Covid stuff for me, nuclear weapons being in Scotland stuff for me, a decade of Tory government Scotland didn't elect stuff for me, it's a weak left opposition in England stuff for me, attempting to frame independence as anti-English bigotry stuff for me, it's trying to ban anti-capitalist references in schools stuff for me, it's England-centric lefties painting SNP as a protest vote even though Scottish Labour is spineless stuff for me, it's the UK for me. Hi there, I'm, I'm Cliff. And I'm Russ. And I'm from, we're from the Veterans for Scottish Independence 2.0 group. And uh, we're just invading your privacy today to, to let you know that we will be uh, very shortly uh, pushing a programme out on live stream uh, to do with uh, uh, the veterans, uh, their needs, uh, as it will be uh, during an independent campaign. Uh, sorry, the next independence campaign, uh, and indeed in the independence Scotland. So get yourself in gear, come and join us, fill up a sandbag. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot. Never miss a live stream. The What's On Guide to live stream events and shows now has its own website. You can find the guide at whatsonguide.scot, independencelive.net or on multiple Facebook pages. Do you create your own live stream events and shows? Get them registered on the guide. See whatsonguide.scot for full details. It's the Brexit stuff for me, the nepotism stuff for me, breaking international law stuff for me, the ERG hijacking UK democracy stuff for me, education is a luxury stuff for me, £9,000 tuition a year stuff for me, it's the NHS on the table for a US trade deal stuff for me, demonising the working classes stuff for me, refusing starving children free school meals stuff for me, it's Boris calling Muslim women letterboxes stuff for me, his picking any's comments stuff for me, his bum boys comments stuff for me, his Scotland as a verminous race comments stuff for me, the UK internal market bill ripping up the devolution settlement stuff for me, devolved legislators being ignored during Brexit stuff for me, a lack of UK leadership during Covid stuff for me, nuclear weapons being in Scotland stuff for me, a decade of Tory government Scotland didn't elect stuff for me, it's a weak left opposition in England stuff for me, attempting to frame independence as anti-English bigotry stuff for me, it's trying to ban anti-capitalist references in schools stuff for me, it's England-centric lefties painting SNP as a protest vote even though Scottish Labour is spineless stuff for me, it's the UK for me. It's a song I wrote about five minutes ago called Carpe Diem, Hope Over Fear. How you threatened my words from an empire of money and gold. Well, 
you've seen and your country's potential for the lies you've been sold. Are you scared that the walls are too high to be breached by the bold? Will you stand and be counted or shut up and do what you're told? Hope over fear, don't be afraid. Smashed up Tories and Scotland's no longer your slave. Can't pay the end. Will you seize the day? Rip the chains from the unicorn. Scotland's no longer your slave. Let the TV man call you a nationalist for rejecting the lies. Ha. All the wobs of the few off the bob Cos he wears shots and ties When they tell you that Scotland's no great Are you really surprised? Will you stand and be counted For something that money can't buy? Hope over fear Don't be afraid That Scotland's no longer your slave. Carpe diem. Will you seize the day? Rip the chains from the unicorn. Scotland's no longer your slave. On the climb, fighting wars for the wealth of the few. How many have died? You can bury my bones, but the truth of it can't be denied. Will you stand and be counted? Cause I'll be there, stood by your side. Hope over fear. Don't be afraid The Westminster Tories of Scotland's no longer your slave Can't be the end Will you seize the day? Rip the chains from the unicorn Scotland's no longer your slave Will the media tell you that England don't want you to go And the taxpayer funded MPs Tell you just tell them no No But in Manchester, Nottingham, Sheffield They already know And they're fighting for them And it's only the start of the show Ha <laughs> ha Hope over peace be afraid Tell Westminster Tories that Scotland's no longer your slave Can't be the air My friend, will you seize the day? With the chains from the unicorn Scotland's no longer your slave Oh yes Ha <laughs> ha!